Production support for the Friday Zone is provided by Smithville, a locally owned business serving central and southern Indiana since 1922, with residential and business internet, voice, and security services. Smithville, local pride, global technology. Information at smithville.net. The Margaret A. Cargill Foundation. And WTIU members, thank you. What's today's forecast? Friday Zone fun! That's right, come join us in the zone as we face the elements in our show about weather. You're not alone. You're in the zone. So hang up the phone. And get in the zone. Get in the zone. The Friday Zone. You're in the zone. Hello everybody and welcome into the Friday Zone. Today in the Zone we are going to be talking about something that affects us on a daily basis. The weather. Now here in Indiana we have varying seasons and the weather can be pretty crazy at times. Yeah. Now did you know the hottest day ever recorded in Indiana was 116 degrees and the lowest ever recorded was negative 36 degrees. Ooh. Talk about crazy. But to make our lives a little easier in the morning as you're heading off to school is our local weather man or woman. Their job is to analyze and report on the weather to remind us to pick up our umbrellas or wear our mittens. We were so interested in how our local meteorologists report the weather to us, we sent the Friday Zone field crew up to WTHR News Center in Indianapolis to get a closer behind the scenes look at what it takes to be a meteorologist in our first weather zone. Neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night strays the Friday Zone field crew on their quest to find out more about our weather. We met up with meteorologist Chris Wright from Channel 13 WTHR Indianapolis to see how the experts deliver the best weather forecast. Uh, basically, this is the weather center uh, where all the weather people work. Um, all of our information comes into the national uh, to the weather center from the National Weather Service. All the raw data that we get, satellite pictures, radar, everything we get is back here, and it's also the same area that we use on the air. Uh, all of our weather information comes in here, uh, and as a weather person, it's your job to take the raw data and interpret that and then create graphics to show the home viewer what's important to them and why. Um, you typically get anywhere from two to three minutes for a weather segment, and it can take you two to three hours to actually build the graphics for that, so it's a very labor-intensive thing. A lot of people think you have like a staff meteorologist who does a forecast. They think you have an artist who does that. There's no makeup lady in real TV. Basically, as a weather person, you come in, you interpret the data, you draw the graphics, and then you go on the air and explain to people at home why it's important to them. With all the work that goes into creating what is seen on TV, we wanted to understand how the weather graphics got from computer to the screen behind the meteorologist. So Chris shared a little TV magic. This is our chroma key wall. The reason is this green color because you want to pick a color that people typically don't wear. So I don't have anything close to this color because if you're wearing something close to this color, you'll key out. You'll be covered up with the map that's uh, inside our computer. We got the floor mark here. Inside these blue lines, that's where you stand for weather. It might look like we're running back and forth across the screen, but if you step Outside this line, you step off the screen at home. We got the floor mark for standard definition and also for the widescreen TVs. All the lights are above to uh, illuminate the room to give us a good picture. And the computers over here, the bottom monitor shows what the folks at home see. So when you're watching the weather segment, you'll see me with a map behind me. This computer monitor here at the top, this is the one that shows you what I want behind me. So what I'm looking at when I'm doing weather is I'm looking up here to make sure the correct map is behind me, but I'm also looking back here to make sure at home you're seeing me with a map behind me and not a big green wall. Being a meteorologist was sounding cooler and cooler, but we still had a few questions. Do you have to go to a special weather school to forecast the weather? We wanted to know more. I went on a field trip at a TV station when I was in ninth grade, and I went through uh, the station in Memphis, and I saw my idol, Dave Brown, who was the weather guy there. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to just grow up and do that? And that's how I got interested in it. I uh, went to college to, to study meteorology. It's a regular four-year program. Uh, a lot of universities offered across the state of Indiana, 
It's no, no different from any other collegiate program. It's a lot of math, a lot of science, because you use a lot of that to interpret weather. You don't really go into detail about that every day because you bore people, but it's helpful that you understand it so when you're forecasting what a system is supposed to do, you know why it's supposed to do that. With weather being so temperamental, how do meteorologists get the news to us so fast? We actually get the weather alerts from the National Weather Service. We get it on the computer, it comes through our wire service. We also have a weather radio back here that goes off and we also have a warning system that we can turn on. When the red light is on, that tells you that weather is the big story. And we call it the red on the radar light, for lack of a better term. And when that light goes on, that lets uh, the news people know that we probably need to assign a reporter to cover weather. That reporter is going to come back here and talk to you and figure out hey, the storms are coming in or the snow is going to come in, where should we go to get the pictures first so we can get as much information as we can and get back to the station and get it on the air. Here in the Friday Zone, we love snow, especially when we get to play in it. So we wanted to know if Chris had any control over a snow day. In terms of school closings, that's a computerized program and every school is assigned a code. So when your principal calls in, he has to type in the exact code to tell us that this school is on a closing or a delay. We have a lot of kids who try to call me and tell me that, oh, my school's on a delay, and it's like, nice try. <laughs> it's not, that doesn't work that way, no. Because we, we have to make sure that we don't uh, give out misinformation, have people keeping their kids at home when they should be in school. So Fridays on viewers, if you think you want to be a meteorologist someday, don't call Chris hoping to close school. Instead, have fun in school by studying up in math, science, and computers. Maybe someday we will rely on you to keep us cool in the summer, warm in the winter, dry when it rains, and safe when the weather might take a turn for the worst. Living in Indiana, you have probably had a number of tornado drills and know what to do when a large storm or tornado is heading right for you. But could you imagine actually going outside into the heart of a storm? It's crazy. Well, joining us here in the zone today is James Covington, area storm chaser with over 15 years of experience chasing extreme storms. Also joining me are my two friends, Camilla and Hank, to get to the bottom of this extreme hobby. Welcome, everybody. Glad to be here. So, James, my first question is, what got you started into this extreme hobby of chasing storms? Well, I, uh, maybe a uh, fourth grade teacher, uh, Richard Ziegler, I believe was his name, showed me some pictures of the, uh, the tornado that hit Monroe Central School during uh -huh. the super outbreak in 74, uh, which was a, a half mile wide tornado. It was actually strong enough to rip the railroad tracks out of the ground. Oh wow, that's, uh, that's uh, pretty powerful. And then split into three separate tornadoes right mm -hmm. after it hit the school, mm -hmm. uh, which was where one woman was killed. And I was fascinated. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the older I got, the more interested I, I became. Mm -hmm. And actually, as a, as a child, I was frightened by lightning. So, oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I was very hear thunder and sprint for the house. Yeah, I mean, so. <laughs> I mean, sure. You guys, Hank, have you ever been? Have you ever been in a storm situation? Have been really scared? Um, yeah. I'm sure, and I'm sure you two have too, Camilla. Well, Camilla, you have a question. Do you want to ask James? Yeah. What signs do you look for when a tornado occurs? Well, if you're like at home or something like that, the first thing you want to look for is like uh, when the sky and the clouds uh, go to turn green oh, uh, okay. in the middle of a storm. Or That's not normal usually. A lot so. of times <laughs> you'll see what, what we call a shelf cloud on the front of the storm, and then it'll be very green behind that. And, you know, real dark green, almost the color of grass. And then, uh, you know, most of the tornadoes in Indiana move to the northeast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're looking to the southwest and you see. Uh, you know, that green sky and then the, it begins to hail, that's when you want to start uh, maybe seeking some shelter. Yeah, so and Hank, I know you have a question for James, too. Um, how many, like, in the movie Twister, how many times have you seen, like, something just floating in the sky? And like a car or something, like, or like a cow or all kinds of crazy yeah. stuff were floating around in that movie. Well, most of the tornadoes in Indiana tend to be a little bit weaker than mm -hmm. they are out in the southern plains. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have seen uh, things like some large limbs floating and, oh, wow. and flying around. Stuff no, like no that. witches on broomsticks or bicycles I'm, out there. Huh? I haven't <laughs> seen any flying cows. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, so, Camilla, did you have another question you want to ask James? Um. Well, I know, I if, know. if you don't have a question, I have a question. Um, so. I've heard there's an organization that you are a part of that is, mm -hmm. is that throughout the country or is that locally yeah. or what is that? Yeah, that's called uh, Coca Ross, the mm -hmm. uh, Community Collaborative Rain, Hail and Snow Network. That's something that anyone can get involved with. So any of us could even, mm -hmm. and even the two of them could probably get involved. Is that true? Yeah, as long as there's uh, a, 
you know, a parent that'll help to sign them up. Then, cool. yeah, even kids can get involved. Awesome. Uh, everyone that goes through the uh, either the personalized training or the classes gets a uh, free rain gauge, uh -huh. which holds up to eight inches, uh -huh. and that's a forty dollar value uh -huh. that uh, everyone gets. We all use the same type of gauge, the same methods, and we all report online. Uh -huh. And that you know, with everybody using the same equipment, that that makes the data a little more valuable. Uh -huh. So, I'm the coordinator up around the Muncie area. Cool, so cool. We're trying to get as many people involved as we can, really. Right, yeah. So, Hank, I have a question for you. If you were a storm chaser, what would you do if you saw a huge tornado coming towards you? Would you go right at it, or would you go the other way? Um, I would go right at it. You'd go right at it and just get right in there? What about you, Camilla? Yeah, I'd probably go into it. Yeah, me too. It'd be a little scary and a little extreme, but it'd be fun. While some of the supercells and extreme storms that James seeks out can produce winds up to 110 miles per hour and can be very destructive, but wind is not all that bad. The Friday Zone field crew traveled to Benton County to see how they are harnessing the wind and using it for good in this Friday Zone field trip. The wind can have an effect on so many parts of our daily activities. Wind is air in motion. It is produced by the uneven heating of the Earth's surface by the sun. Wind is a part of the weather that we experience daily. But have you ever heard of the wind harnessing energy? The Friday Zone field crew traveled to Benton County, home of the largest concentrated wind farm in the country, to take a closer look at how wind is used for energy. As we travel through the miles of wind farms, as far as the eye can see, there were just too many to count. Kelly Kepner, Economic Development Director in Benton County, explains. We have 505 turbines right now that we have, but we all have a total of 646 when everything's done. But then we're having a second phase starting up, a little bit over the 505, so we'll have over 1,000 wind turbines here in Benton County. And with over 600 wind turbines, that means a lot of building. Each turbine was built in several pieces, including the base of the turbine that stands 240 feet tall and the blade that stands 110 feet tall. This blade is not your average blade and although it may look similar to an airplane propeller, it actually does the exact opposite. Jimmy Bricker, wind farm expert and our tour guide for the day explains. There is a lot of aerodynamic engineering that goes into the design of the blades. They're not like an airplane propeller. They're actually the reverse. An airplane prop is trying to push wind to move an airplane forward. Here the blades sort of in reverse order is capturing the wind, catching the wind. And so its shape and design is what allows it to catch the wind. And for its sheer size, we were amazed to find out that these massive blades only needed wind speeds of five miles per hour to rotate. Kelly explains to us that even though the blades look like they are not rotating fast, this is actually not the case at all. You have the blades that are rotating at about 15 rotations per minute. So in one minute, that blade is going 15 times around. But when you're talking, if you were sitting at the tip of the blade right here and hanging on, you'd be going approximately 110 miles an hour. Once the wind is harnessed in the form of energy, the wind energy is sent to a grid that is on location. And from the grid, sent via power line to the power companies that will provide homes, businesses, and schools with power and getting these power lines up was not an easy task. One of the largest transmission lines that we have here in Benton County is privately owned line. It was constructed and the wires were hung the spacers by a helicopter and that line runs 23 miles from our wind farms to a substation in, in our neighboring county. Because these wind turbines are scattered through Indiana farmland, we wondered, is there such a thing as too windy? And what about the storms? When there's nobody at the operation and maintenance offices looking at these, they're actually controlled by satellite. One block of our wind farm is controlled by satellite out of Houston and the other one out of Portland, Oregon. The turbines are cylindrical and the blade rotates so that the thin side of the blade is pointing into the wind and they're locked with a brake. And it's pretty hard for a wind force to get around something that's round. Many homes and businesses depend on the renewable resources for their everyday lives. Wind farms are going to continue to be an ingredient in the renewable energy drive for this country. So, Fridays on viewers, if we have you spinning with excitement to learn more about wind farms, wind turbines, or just the sustainable resource of wind power, Kelly has some information for you. Well, if you were to go to find out more information about 
uh, wind energy itself and the different companies, go to awea.org. And if you have to see these massive energy producing machines for yourself, you can visit www.bentoncounty.in.gov to find out how you can take a tour. Lightning is an atmospheric discharge of electricity accompanied by thunder, which typically occurs during thunderstorms. But we here in the zone wanted to know exactly how this phenomenon happens, so we invited Stacy Radford Vincent from the Wonder Lab to teach us a thing or two about lightning. Stacy, so good to have you back. Thanks for having me. Hey, so Hank and Camilla and I would all love to learn about lightning because we talked a little before the show and we're a little scared of it. So can you ease our, ease our fear of lightning and tell us a little bit about it? Well, we're going to start off with one of my favorite scientific tools, balloons. And I'm going to give one to each of you guys. We're going to talk about static electricity. So have you guys ever stuck a balloon to your head with static electricity? Oh, I think that's impossible. Try rubbing that balloon on your head really good. Oh. Rub, 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 rub. I can hear it. Okay. Oh. And then see, just set it there and see if it'll stay. Hank is going at it. All right. Now, now set, set it, it up back there. up. Oh. It's sticking to your face. <laughs> I know. Which right? has hair? Can I, can I put this on your up here? Oh. I can give you a hairdo. Look. Now, Stacy, why okay. is this balloon trying to stick to his hair? It's trying to stick because what we've actually done is rub something called electrons off of one thing and onto another. When we do that, we end up with different charges. And the important thing is that opposite charges attract. So remember that. So you might wonder what this has to do with lightning. Mm -hmm. And it's because lightning is really just a gigantic static electrical charge. <laughs> oh, so is it, does it have the positive or the negative charge in lightning? The, well, the, the lightning generally has that negative charge and it is attracted to a positive charge. When it does that, there's a huge discharge of electricity and that's our lightning. And so we're going to demonstrate that today with this funny looking machine that's in front of us called the Van de Graaff generator. And you can think of it just like a cloud. We're going to do a quick demonstration so that you can see what is going on. So if I could okay. have you guys step back a little All bit. Right. Hank, I think you're, you're the man first. You get to charge. All right. Get well, first up. we're going to do a demonstration of lightning. Oh, of actual yes. lightning. Yes. So let's okay. have have Hank step back. All right. So I'm going to. I have a pedal here. I'm going to turn this on. You may hear kind of a little snapping noise here and there. Like lightning. Yep. Just okay. like lightning. When I bring this close. Ooh. <laughs> Whoa. Oh Whoa. my gosh. All right, so what did that look like? It looked like a mini lightning strike. And that's exactly what it is. If you stuck your finger in there, ow. ow. It would probably hurt. So lightning is something to be afraid of because it can be very dangerous. And we're going to see today kind of what it feels like before you get struck by lightning. Right. And so I think Hank here, here is going to try it out for us. You know All right, this? now, Hank, you're going to put your hand right up on our dome here. Okay, keep it up on there. Now, Stacy, you said this dome kind of was like a cloud. Does the cloud right. emit a, both positive and a negative charge, or is it only? Is it, it has both charges. Okay. Uh, but as those charges build up, it wants to get rid of some of them. All right, and it they needs like to separate, get, don't they? Right. Okay. Exactly. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to turn this on. We're going to charge up that static electricity. Why don't you use your other hand so that you can Look out there so everyone can see you. Can you <laughs> that, that'll work there too. All right. She's ready for Keep you your feet it. on the stool so none of the charges escape. And we'll see. Your hair's kind of short, but we'll see if we can get it to stand up. All right, you ready? Oh, there it goes. Can you see it? Whoa. In I'm the sure. back. My shirt. It's, lifting up it's already. like my shirt's lifting up too. It's like, like your shirt's lifting up there. Look me, at his hair in the like front. Give me a close up. <laughs> give me a close up. <laughs> give me a close up on my hair. Like, look at this. Now, Hank, does that oh. feel weird? <gasps> Stacy, oh. his hand. It sounds like electricity. Yep. All right, go ahead and take your hand off of there, Whoa. Hank. I'm going to oh, wow. discharge it. Cool. Ow, 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 ow. All right, ow. so you did, in fact, hear the electricity coming okay. off of his fingers. That's what you were hearing was those charges. So they're trying to get away from this? Exactly. Wow. Now, the feeling that you just had with your hair standing up and everything was because you were sharing a charge with this dome. Now remember I said opposites attract? 
On the other hand, the like charges repel. So every single one of your hairs on your head and on your arms all over your body gets that charge and they try to get away from each other. And that's what makes your hair start to stand up. It's trying to repel or get away from one another. So, I guess that you're next. Do you want to try, Camilla? All right. All right. This is going to be funny. Go ahead and that put your hand on there. Go like this. Now we'll probably see just the Put front start to Put stand up, hand. okay? Here we go. Just Whoa, no, I can no, feel it. Sides. I see Whoa. Yeah, Stacey, it's hands. so Flip loud in her hand. Mm -hmm. oh, that's cool. Like, like this, you make a really loud noise. Back up just a little bit, oh, okay? Yeah, Ow. <laughs> oh, I can hear this. Okay, right. so now okay, go if ahead, she were to step off. down while she was on that, it would be the electrical current would then Go to the That's floor, right. Correct? Yes, that okay. charge would go right through her and get struck. When she stands on the stool, she's she's not grounded, as we say. And when you're grounded, the charge passes through you. That's when you feel it. Okay. If you're up like this, off the ground, you won't feel the charge. That's also why squirrels don't get shocked when they run on electrical wires. Uh -huh. So, if that feeling is to ever come to us while we're outside, what should we do? What you want to do is squat down. You don't want to lay down. You want to squat down. Lightning will generally strike the tallest thing around. If you feel that tickly feeling, that means that the charges that are in the earth are starting to drop through you and attract that charge from up above. Oh. So you want to squat down, all right? And also remember, you never want to take shelter under a tree when there's a big lightning storm they're coming. they're tall, right? They're very tall. And if that tree gets struck by lightning, you're probably going to get some of exactly. it too. Well, Stacy, thank you so much. Now we took a glimpse into an extreme storm with James, and Stacy taught us a little bit about lightning. So now let's take a look as former host Echo Chappelle and two friends of the Friday Zone took a closer look at different weather systems in an experiment that you can try at home too. In this Friday Zone flashback. Jennifer, Stephanie, and I are going to show you some cool experiments that demonstrate different weather systems. They're pretty simple experiments that you can try at home. And I'm going to go ahead and start out. I'm going to do an experiment that demonstrates convection, right? Mm -hmm. And this is really easy. All you have to do is take a little rectangular plastic dish. And the really important thing is to make sure that the water is super still. So don't lean on the table. And we're going to make sure that it's not going to move at all. It looks pretty still. All you have to do is take some ice cubes and put some blue food coloring in there so that it turns the ice cubes blue. I'm going to put this on one side. And the, another important thing is that the water is room temperature because that's going to let us demonstrate the air currents and stuff. Okay, so I'm going to drop this in on this side. And this demonstrates, or this represents the cold air masses. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to put a couple current or a couple drops of red food coloring on this side. And this represents the warm air, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do we see happening here? Okay, well, what you're representing with the cold air and the warm air is you're trying to represent where these two would meet, right? And what normally happens is that when they meet, the warm air, because it's less dense, is going to be forced on top of the cold air. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of uplift that generates a thunderstorm. So the cold air here and the warm air here mm -hmm. are going to meet, sure, or they should meet. <laughs> it just all works out. <laughs> and when the warm air is pushed on top, right there in the middle is where a thunderstorm would happen. Sure, right where they meet, and it starts to really push that air up, and then you generate this sort of vertical uplift, which creates the big tall clouds. Where it's you get working. The from. It's looking purple. It is, and you can see the warm air on yes. top and the cold air on the bottom. Mm -hmm. I like that, that's cool. So that's kind of what's happening today. Yes, yes it is. We do have a lot of cloud cover today. That's really cool. Now Stephanie, you are going to demonstrate what? How to make a tornado. A tornado. Awesome. So we took two old water bottles, took off the labels, and filled one with water. Now what do you do next? Um, you put a couple of drops of blue in the bottle that has some water. And that has the water in it. Okay. Looks good to me. And you put the washer on top of okay. it. Okay. The washer in the middle. And you put the empty bottle on top of the washer. You want me to hold that for you so you can tape on? Yes, please. Okay. And then I'll be on scissor duty. 
Hey, sounds good to me. <laughs> it won't come. So explain to us one more time what happens during a tornado that we're going to be seeing. Well, tornadoes are generally spawned from thunderstorms, and you get if you get a really strong rotation that's lifted upwards, and this rotation starts to narrow, you accelerate, which is what we're going to see with the bottles. Mm -hmm. And then the winds become so strong in this vortex, they call it, that we get uh, a, a spirally cloud. And once that touches down to the ground, then we call it a tornado. What do you call it when it doesn't touch down to the ground? It's just a funnel cloud. And you know what? I had another question that I didn't ask earlier, but that I just thought of now. What's the difference between a watch and a warning? Okay, well, a watch means that the conditions are conducive to a tornado forming. When you hear that there's a warning, mm -hmm. that means that someone spotted a tornado either on the radar or on the ground, and you have to take cover. So you should go to the interior of the house if you don't have a basement or into the basement. So the warning's what we really don't want to hear, right? Well, the warning's what you don't want to hear. <laughs> if you hear the watch, then you listen for the warning. Okay. All right, scissors duty. I think we're good to go. What we did is we taped the two bottles together to seal it up so that there wouldn't be any leaking. Let's hope that there isn't. All right, go ahead. Let's see the tornado in action. So you shake, shake it up a little bit to get the water rotating. Uh-huh. Then you flip it over. Swirl it up some more. Okay, you see awesome. the funnel right in there? Because it's being forced into this tiny hole, the rotation starts to speed up in order to get through that little opening. It does, it looks exactly like a tornado. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank Camilla and Hank for helping us out today in the zone. I also want to thank storm chaser James Covington for sharing his experiences with us. And a big thanks to Stacy Rafford Vincent for a shockingly good time today. Shoo, oh. Shock you did. Don't forget to write to us if you have any great storm stories at FridayZone.org. And remember, you can download your favorite episode for free on iTunes. Remember to live, learn, and play the Friday Zone way. We'll see you right here next week. See you guys. Bye-bye. support for the Friday Zone is provided by Smithville, a locally owned business serving central and southern Indiana since 1922, with residential and business internet, voice, and security services. Smithville, local pride, global technology. Information at smithville.net. The Margaret A. Cargill Foundation. And WTIU members, thank you.